Do you ever find yourself in that situation where you suddenly need a pair of Regency short stays, like really quickly? So inconvenient when that happens, but fortunately, Regency short stays are some of the fastest support garments in pre-industrial history, and Red Threaded offer a very decent historically appropriate pattern, so let's do this. Okay, fast is relative since I will still be hand sewing these and making some alterations to the pattern instructions, like for example cutting off all the seam allowance to try and implement more original practice construction methods. So a person could probably do these faster by machine, but personally I find no fun in that. So here we are, cutting out an interlining layer from some nice medium weight linen. This will be used to give the stays a little bit of structure under the more decorative fabric layer and also to form the boning pockets and to finish the edges nicely. I managed to get all of these stays pieces out of this one little scrap of silk taffeta, which is very exciting news. Always so satisfying when you get to do a nice bit of cabbage busting, especially with small projects like this. All the pieces are cut out with a bit of seam allowance that I'm just estimating by eye since it doesn't really matter with hand sewing. You just need to pay attention to the stitching lines rather than the edge of the fabric, hence why it was easier to cut the seam allowances off the pattern so I could easily mark in those stitching lines myself. The straps, however, are having their edges bound, so I'm cutting these net, that is, without seam allowance, all around the edges except where they'll attach to the body of the stays, wherein they will need some seam allowance. Then I can pin my fabric pieces to the corresponding interlining pieces with the marked sides facing out so I can reference them. For the most part, these won't really show once I've got the seams in, but the marks that will stay, like the boning channels for instance, are perfectly historical. Extant stays all throughout history bear dark marking lines for boning channels, sometimes in ink, like they're really dark. They really didn't care as long as it made their work easier. Plus, they probably didn't have fancy disappearing pens, which the modern seamster would probably prefer to use if they wished for these marking lines not to be seen in the end. But me, I care not. And I'm just basting these into place to hold them until I can stitch everything together. I'm going to be assembling this using a method that we see throughout stay-making history, more commonly in the 17th and 18th centuries, although the Regency is still in this transitionary period, and I love this method, so I'm going to use it. It involves turning under the fabric and interlining layers on all your pieces first, so that all the raw edges are hidden right from the start. But I'm leaving the top and bottom, or otherwise outside, edges of the stays raw for now since these will get bound separately later. I'll do this on all edges that get seamed to other pieces, so around the long edges of the gussets, the side seams of the body pieces, and the body attachment edge of the strap. The pattern does this clever thing where it's extended the back piece a few inches beyond the center back edge, so this I can fold back on the center back line and fell that raw edge down to the interlining on the back. This will act as an extra strengthening layer for the strip where the eyelets will go. These, as you can imagine, see lots of stress and pull, so it's always nice to have a bit of reinforcement along that area. And with the pieces prepped, I can start stitching in the boning channels. This is done with a tight back stitch, mostly just for visual aesthetic of the continual stitches rather than the spaced out stitches made by running stitches. I also realized pretty quickly that the pattern is intended for flat steels and I'm using quarter inch synthetic whalebone for a more historical feel. So I did have to narrow the width of the boning channels on mine.
You'll notice that there are really only a handful of bones in this. Contrary to the 17th century, which is pretty much entirely encased in these tiny little narrow bones, stays through the 18th century can become less boned and even half boned. By the early 19th century, where we are with the Regency period, long and short stays have become super lightweight with a wood or whalebone busk down the front and really only a couple of bones around the rest of the body, if they're boned at all. Some of them, especially by the 20s and 30s, are stiffened just with cotton cord. This trend of ultra lightweight support continues until around the 1840s and 50s when we start to readopt baleen and eventually steel. So, sorry Bridgerton, but this is historically impossible. Tighter. While I still have the pieces flat, I'm just going ahead and marking out the eyelid placement. I want this to spiral lace, which is the more historically common form of lacing, although cross-lacing was starting to become more common at this time, so wouldn't technically be incorrect. Spiral lacing requires very specific eyelet placement though. The bottom two will need to be parallel before we can start ascending, so one side of the garment will have two weirdly close together eyelets at the bottom and the top. This is normal. The second eyelet on the first side is going to be half an inch above the first. I'm then moving in a zigzag path, alternating sides and marking each point at a half an inch up from the last, so that on each side the dots will appear to be one inch apart, except for the starting and stopping holes, where once again the final two will be placed parallel to each other. I promise this is a lot less confusing in person than it is to explain. Each eyelet is first formed with a sharp awl to gently pierce through the weave of the material before being widened by a tapering awl. The goal with hand-sewn eyelets is to separate the weave widely enough to form a hole, but not actually to cut or break the threads, since this will weaken your fabric significantly. Cut holes are fine for metal grommets, but with hand sewing, we want to be pulling back the unbroken threads as much as possible. This is easier to do on some fabrics than others. This super tightly woven silk taffeta, for example, will only separate so much, so I'm going to have very small eyelid holes on this one. I'll just have to make sure to use a fine lace and perhaps a bogkin for threading the lace through if I find the holes are still too fine. One of my favorite things about historical garment making is learning all the little things they did to be more efficient. One of those things being not bothering to tie off the thread after every eyelid when doing a whole row of them. There are copious extant stays in garments throughout history boasting this connecting thread where the original maker simply carried on to the next eyelid hole without stopping and starting a new thread. Because who doesn't want to save a good 30 to 45 business seconds? All of our pieces are now interlined, basted, edge finished, boning channeled, eyelided, and are ready for assembly. Which, since there is no seam finishing necessary now, is actually a super quick process. The edges are simply lined up and then whip stitched together with some doubled silk buttonhole twist thread. This is extremely strong thread, more so when doubled, and when pulled nice and taut will make for a nice, durable, but fast seam.
This is a method that has been used in stay making for a few hundred years by this point, and while it doesn't produce the most inconspicuous seam, it was still strong and fast and suitable for an undergarment. Although, personally, I really like the visible stitching that shows through when the seam is flattened and the pieces line up edge to edge. I find it nice to visually celebrate the work that goes into a garment every now and then, especially in this day and age when it's often more fashionable for labor to stay quiet and invisible. The straps are going to be attached in the same way, although because I didn't prep the top edges of my pieces before assembly, I'll have to go in and do that just now. I'm just marking the width of the strap base so that I'll only have to fold these sections. The binding will also trace all around the edges of the straps as part of the finished stays. Now it's time to add some gussets to allow room for the bust. As is the general purpose of historical support garments, we are trying to support things, not to flatten and compress. The pattern calls for two of these on each side, so I'm cutting into my front piece along my marked lines and preparing the edges according to the previous method so that they can be attached also according to the previous method. Oh, and I guess I stopped mid-gusset to put in the front panel eyelets that will connect the straps because I didn't do that earlier. Okay, anyway, back to gussets. The peak point is a nightmare to get neat looking, both in terms of the folding and the sewing, and inevitably you're going to end up with some fraying at this point. If not now, then eventually. I'll go in later with a reinforcement stitch to make sure those points stay nice and strong. Seeing all these rows of whip stitches appearing is so satisfying. And now with the stays all but together, it is time to add the boning. I'm using a quarter inch synthetic baleen here, which mimics real baleen in behavior and consistency for a more historical feel. It's super flexible and will mold to shape with wear, which should hopefully make for a nice and comfy pair of stays once they're broken in.
And last but not least, or definitely least after like the 15th hour of doing it, the binding. Historically, this could be done with a sturdy ribbon like Grosgrain or with fabric. While I was so tempted to use one of the beautiful ribbons I have in stock, the only vaguely appropriate thing would be one of these silks, but silk ribbon is not at all suitable for keeping bones in due to its loose weave structure. So I'm going to be cutting some binding myself out of this nice, tightly woven cream silk taffeta. Silk taffeta tends to be super tightly woven, so should be well up to the task of holding in pokey bones. I know it took all my willpower not to go with plum or dark green or brown, but Regency gowns are so often white or pale colored. I didn't want to risk a bold binding showing through a dress fabric if these stays are ever to be used for a light project in future. The practicality of reuse and all that. I'm cutting these strips an inch wide, which will accommodate plenty of seam allowance and edge folding, and to the horror of many modern seamsters, I am absolutely sure, historical binding is almost ubiquitously cut on the straight, not on the bias. This saves a ton of fabric since you're not cutting diagonally through a perfectly good piece of valuable handwoven material, and if the binding is narrow enough, it can take a curve with little issue. The binding is attached in the usual manner, or backstitched on the front, turned, folded, and fell down on the back. Okay, so maybe the binding didn't take 15 hours, only about six or seven, which is a really good amount of time to, I don't know, learn a new skill while your hands are busy, or learn to stitch if your hands are not yet busy and you have to spend all seven of those hours just staring at the wall. How boring. So it's a really good thing that Skillshare has sponsored this video and set us up with a nice deal to get us learning. If you haven't already heard, Skillshare is the largest online learning community built towards crafty and creative people. You'll find thousands of classes in all manner of subject from fine arts, music, video, photography, and hands-on crafts like knitting and crochet. And of course, some historical hand sewing from yours truly. I'm not sure if I've mentioned this anywhere actually, but we dropped a new class late last year walking you through some more hand stitches beyond just the basics if you haven't already seen it and want to give it a go. I have personally been using Skillshare for years now. It's the first place I go whenever I need to learn a new technique in my video craft or brush up on something that I don't feel I'm quite satisfied with yet. They've made this really easy by putting together learning paths, which are curated sequential class collections to help you master a specific skill or competency level. And it really takes the stress out of having to decide which classes to watch first. The first 500 people to use my link will get a one month free trial of Skillshare, so head down to the description if you would like to join. Oh my god, are you kidding me? Why? Um, this is so rude. There. Are you happy? You're like one, one more inch of length there? Fortune hath frowned upon me this day. And thus, the chaos is tamed and the piece of construction becomes a garment. In order to put this on a body though, we will need to acquire some laces, which I'm just making up into a three strand braid with some cotton floss. I do need these to be on the finer side since my eyelet holes are going to be quite small.
One of the things I love most about foundation garments is how they just immediately pull you into another time. It's like, this isn't rocket science or extreme evolution. Human anatomy has always been human anatomy, and it's just what we do with the exoskeleton that makes people in portraits look so different from us today. These figures and these silhouettes are still so achievable simply by paying attention to the foundation garments and the way that people historically masterfully created clothing in order to artfully shape the human body. Not only do I find it really cool, of course, to recreate silhouettes and styles of the past, especially ones that are so different from things that we're used to today, but I also think it's a really great reminder of how fleeting trends are and how aesthetic can very much be an art form that can be played with and explored and doesn't necessarily have to be adhered to strictly in this sort of life or death desperation that I feel like we are often so pressured into adhering to aesthetics and beauty standards today. I feel like a significant percentage of my career is dedicated to just sewing undergarments because you always need undergarments to go under the outer things, but now that we have an undergarment, maybe it's time to explore what goes over these days. Okay, wait, 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 hear me out though. Regency stays in modern fashion. Yes, yes, I say let's do it. <gasps> yes, yes, here's a look, here's a look. <laughs>